good afternoon. It's nice to see both of you. This is uh, our second edition of Coffee with Kathy. And uh, today I'm welcoming Teresa Younger and Jillian Gilchrist. And we're here to talk about FMLA. Uh, and I was wondering, Teresa, if you could just sort of tell folks what FMLA is all about. Sure. Uh, FMLA, Family Medical Leave Act, is a, both a state and a federal piece of legislation, an act that's on the books that ensures that if you need to take time off to care for yourself, to care for a family member, or for the birth of, or adoption of a new baby or child, you can take the time up off uh, minimally six weeks, uh, oftentimes much longer than that, and you can still return to work. So people forget that there was a time when women needed to take time off to give birth and their jobs were not reserved for them when they came back. And so they would, you know, leave to give birth and they return back to their job six, eight weeks later and the job would no longer be there. And, you know, the, their employer would say, well, you weren't here, so we gave your job to somebody else. There are circumstances in people's lives, including giving birth, adopting a child, taking care of yourself, taking care of a family member where you need to have time off and you need to be able to take that time off and return back to your job. And this is a protection for both men and women to use. Family medical leave uh, is, is something that both men and women can use to take time off to care for themselves. And that's you know six, eight, 12 weeks. Uh, and they're able to do that. And, and you negotiate the length of time with your employer. And, and I think it is amazing that people um, are now starting to recognize that FMLA has some uh, or Family Medical Leave Act, and it's you, it's easy to fall into the acronyms, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> and, and sometimes we, you know, uh, we want to make sure that people actually have other benefits along with it. But m more and more of us every day deal with family members, in particular our parents who need a little bit of help. Right. Uh, and it it is important and imperative that we're able to take care of them. And, and you've stressed that sometimes we actually have to take care of ourselves after we take care of our children and our <laughs> parents. We sometimes end up having to take care of ourselves for uh, things like having cancer or uh, as, as uh, horrific as cancer or as simple as having knee surgery. Right. So it could be something mundane and it could be something catastrophic uh, that people have happened that they need to take a little bit of time off from work in order to deal with particular situations. And sometimes they're planned and sometimes they're not planned. So, yeah. you know, I think that's really an important component. But we have a whole generation of people who are professionals or working who have only ever grown up with access to the Family Medical Leave Act, you know, only grown up knowing that they can take, care, take that time off and have their jobs protected. And so, you know, it's really important that people understand what this, uh, what this leave is. It applies to uh, large companies of 50 employers, 75 employers or more. I think you we're having an anniversary right now, aren't we? We are. We're at the 25th anniversary of the Family Medical Leave Act on the federal level. And what people have to understand, Connecticut was actually the first state in the union to have passed any components of the Family Medical Leave Act, and it was our own congressional leadership that took it to Washington, D.C., that made it part of the federal law. So Connecticut has really been a leader in understanding family-friendly workplace policies and understanding and hearing and responding to what needs to happen. And it's uh, the Permanent Commission on the Status of Women, which I work for, was one of the lead agencies that brought people in and worked with the leg legislature here in the state of Connecticut to make sure that we had laws on the books that protected women and their families. And uh, over this last session, uh, we have sought to address what are some of the shortcomings of Family Medical mm -hmm. Leave Act. And Jillian, I was wondering if you wanted to go through some of those shortcomings and sort of talk a little bit towards them. Sure. So what we found is about 50% of people nationwide actually aren't eligible for FMLA. So FMLA applies to employers, like Teresa said, of 50 or 75 or more. Um, in Connecticut, it's 75 or more, and you can have up to 16 weeks. At the federal level, it's for employers of 50 or more, and you get 12 weeks. And so about 50% of people don't work for employers of that size, so they don't even get the job protection. For those who do work in employers of that size and are protected under FMLA, a study was done and about 78% of people still can't afford to take an unpaid leave. So it is a job protection, which is fabulous, but it's an unpaid job protection. And so we're finding that more and more when someone needs time off of work, again, for their own illness, to care for a loved one or for a new baby, they can't afford to take the leave. And we also have a lot of employers that can't afford to provide coverage for those. So we passed a bill this, uh, this session that I think would 
be able to address some of the, that, uh, those shortcomings in it, the Family Medical Leave Insurance Act. It's a yes. study. So what we're asking for this year, and thank you, because uh, the Labor Committee has passed out the bill, is for a Family Medical Leave Insurance Task Force. And what this task force would do would look at how Connecticut can offer some type of partial wage replacement program when a person needs time off to take care, again, of them, their own selves, a loved one like an elderly parent, um, or a newborn. And so we're asking for a task force because there are a lot of questions that arise uh, when thinking about this. Who would pay for it? Um, who would administer it? And who would be eligible? And so we've asked that a diverse group of individuals come together to study this issue for a year and look at how Connecticut could offer this. And I think that it has a, a lot of support. Are there other states that have done this uh, uh, and attached it to any other pieces of legislation besides the Family Medical Leave Act? Yep, there's California and New Jersey. Now they already did have state temporary disability insurance programs, but they've since tacked on uh, family medical leave insurance. Um, and then there are the state of New York and Washington have proposals in this year. Um, so other states are doing this. The, there are studies now showing that when someone does have a partial wage replacement when they need a leave, that they actually have greater attachment to the workforce. Uh, they're less likely to go into poverty. Mm -hmm. um, so there's lots of, we're seeing benefits out of California's model and New Jersey that we're hoping we can replicate here in Connecticut. So in an already stressful situation, this, this would provide a mechanism for people not to have that additional worry where they did not have wages coming in because you know, Teresa, uh, we actually uh, do need to provide for lights in our home and food <laughs> on our tables and those are things that uh, this would uh, allow us to continue to yeah, do. This, this allows economic security for families. You know, it really allows for you to pay into a system and then draw down on that system when you need it. But there are so many questions we need to ask about how that happens that the task force is really about starting to ask those questions. And what we have to keep in mind is, uh, you know, the United States is one of the few countries, few developed countries in the world that doesn't have a paid family medical leave plan at all. And so, you know, this puts in place, this moves, you know, Connecticut and, and the country really much closer to hosting the conversation. And we don't want to rush in. We want to make sure that we've asked all the questions to make sure that the families in Connecticut where, you know, housing is costs, you know, a third oftentimes of your, of your income, child care is exceptionally high. Also, you know, we need, we have transportation costs, we have high oil costs, all of those expenses, uh, you know, just because you had knee surgery or just because you had a baby, shouldn't mean that you lose your home or can't pay for, you know, heat in your house or can't turn the lights on. And so we want to make sure that families can make that can take that leave in times of emergency and can take that leave when it is planned and be able to provide for their families. Well, I'm really excited. Um, so the task force is, uh, has a number of people on it. Uh, Jillian, if you wanted to go through sort of who we put on it so that we could address some of those issues. Sure, so it's um, individuals that have interests or have knowledge about uh, childcare needs. Um, we also have uh, ARP representation, so that whole piece about being in the sandwich generation and having to take uh, care of an elderly parent and your own child. Um, we've invited the business community to the table, um, advocates that support family economic security, so just a whole diversity. Insurance. Yeah. Um, Health care, we've invited the state comptroller to the table. We've invited a really broad, we want the table to be as large as possible so that we can have as many voices there. And I really want people to understand that this is something that the business community um, has been invited to and the insurance community has been invited to so that they understand that uh, those folks who uh, typically um, uh, might be opposed uh, to this because of the cost to business it, are going to be sitting with us in order to figure out a very important need for their um, workers uh, in, in those industries. And Absolutely. We always, we're, you know, in the state we're talking about jobs, 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 and you know this right. well. And, you know, creating really uh, family-friendly work environments helps promote jobs and helps create commitment. And we want businesses at the table for this conversation because this is about making Connecticut a much better place to live and work. Well, I would tell you, just so you know, Teresa, that we are doing a couple of things uh, in the Labor Committee, uh, slightly different this year, and, you, and uh, we've invited the Workforce Investment Boards to actually come to the table in an informational hearing. It will be happening on April 11th. I'm hoping you'll have time to come over and listen in, uh, because we want to make some recommendations for folks about jobs. 
uh, uh, and what we can uh, give to our workforce investment boards to help uh, get some uh, some living wage jobs, uh, more mm -hmm. living wage jobs in Connecticut to bring up this, uh, the economic standards in Connecticut. So I'm really excited about doing that. And I'm hoping that doing work like this will also uh, give us those uh, protections that we need uh, because everybody has a parent and everybody has a child and we all know that every once in a while we need to spend some time with them. Absolutely. And it is important for us to take care of ourselves so that we're healthy to take care of our families and women tend to uh, have that uh, burden. Mm -hmm. yeah, very much so. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you coming, just giving a little overview on FMLI and I'd hope to have you back as this goes through the process and we can uh, give uh, constituents an ability to hear how we're going with this. That'd be great. That'd be great. Thank great. you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.